with Small Arm Solutions. Today is a day that many of you have asked for. Uh, many of you know that I am not a fan of the M14 uh, by no means, and you guys have always wanted me to do a review and say why. So, uh, back by popular demand, uh, we're finally going to do that video uh, talking about why I despise the M14 as much as I do. And these reasons are of several. Uh, one is because of the failure of our Ordnance Corps to give our troops the proper weapon and proper ammunition, and that both of them is, is, is predominant. Uh, for as far as the ammunition is concerned, uh, going adopting the 762 by 51 millimeters, the NATO round that uh, the U.S. forced down NATO's throat and it provided them with a heavier cartridge that was really not even, it wasn't even an intermediate cartridge. It, it put us well behind what the Warsaw Pact was dealing with their intermediate caliber. Uh, we would find that very, very quickly in, in the jungles of Vietnam when we encountered the AK 47s. And our troops had had the M14, which was a nightmare. Uh, that's why the M16 was rushed into service. But if we go into it from the beginning and we look at the NATO trials, um, that's really where a lot of this begins. It, it's typical U.S. Ordnance Corps. It is where they are so hell-bent on tradition that they will not look at new concepts, even if that new concept that they have puts our soldiers in harm's way or puts our soldiers behind the enemy. And uh, that's exactly what happened with the adoption of the 762 by 51 millimeter. It was the same thing with the weapon as well. Uh, you know, you provide our soldiers with an inferior weapon uh, just because you want to keep your arsenals running and you want to keep with your traditional uh, wooden iron M1 Garand. So I think that's uh, that's where we're going to start is talking about the, the NATO trials uh, in the 1950s for the new NATO cartridge. Starting with, with this, uh, during the 1950s, NATO was supposed to standardize on uh, not only uh, one type of ammunition, but one type of firearm as well. Due to the fact that if you looked after World War II, you would see that, you know, the British with the 303 British, the Russians 762x54R, uh, the Germans with the 792x57, and then, of course, uh, throughout uh, throughout uh, Europe, you would see various 6.5s and, you know, the U.S. 30, 30 caliber. Um, they wanted to have something that would be standard, standardized for everybody. And there's a lot of logical reasons for this. Uh, if we are engaged in, uh, you know, in, in battles uh, with our you know, with enemies and we have our allies there, we're able to resupply them with ammunition, resupply them with magazines and even firearms if need be. Uh, so that standardization was very, very important. But uh, let's talk about World War II. The Germans redefined modern-day warfare with Blitzkrieg. It got rid of the trench war of World War I. It got rid of the long uh, one-mile shots or the thousand-yard shots or whatnot. It brought combat very, very close, well with under 300 meters, and in a lot of cases, well under 100. And they were looking at the concept of going with an intermediate caliber cartridge. Intermediate caliber cartridge means it is in power, uh, in between that of a high-powered rifle and that of a pistol. And what it would do is it would give a soldier uh, a lot more firepower at, re at the normal range. Um, since your engagements aren't going to be at 1,000 meters, why do we need a cartridge that has that kind of power? Not only that kind of power to reach out that far, but also the power and recoil. The Germans developed what was referred to as the MP44, or later the MP45 uh, Sturmgewehr, or Storm Rifle. Although this concept was not uh, viewed very highly by Adolf Hitler, in fact, he canceled it, if I recall, twice. And it was done in secrecy. Uh, originally, it was called a machine carabiner, uh, which was a carbine. Hitler had only used for um, machine gewehrs or machine guns or MPs or machine pistols. Uh, he had no interest in any kind of a new rifle. But the Germans had saw the benefit of the of a lighter weight rifle, selective fire, high capacity magazine. It would be able to put out a low recoil, accurate burst of fire, uh, which would really increase the firepower uh, on the individual level. Okay, looking right here, we had the standard, this is the standard Nazi rifle and machine gun cartridge, a 7.92 by 57 millimeter. Uh, and what we had here was a 181 grain bullet going about 2,700 feet a second. And this was used in the, in the 98Ks, it was used in the MG42s, uh, MG43s, and uh, it, was, it was standard throughout the war. When they came out with the Sturmgewehr, as you can see, very different. And here we see the 7.92 by 33 Kurs. Kurs refers to as short. And that gives you a velocity of 2,400 foot a second. This made a major difference uh, in, in the soldier's ability to uh, react in an ambush, to provide accurate suppressive fire. These guns mostly saw use in the Russian front. It was unfortunate for the Germans, anyways, that it was too late in the war for this to make much of a difference. If this cartridge would have been made available to the Germans earlier on in the war, this could have made a major impact on the outcome of many battles with the, with the Allies. This particular rifle and this cartridge would have uh, outdone anything that the Allies had, including the M1 Garand. 
So now we're going to skip to the post-World War II time period with the Soviets. The main cartridge that the Soviets used in their rifles and machine guns was 762 by 54 r Now this cartridge here uh, is the longest serving military cartridge in history. Uh, this goes back to the late 1800s and it is still in use today. Uh, this cartridge was used back then in World War II in the Mosin Nagants and in all of their belt fed machine guns that they had. And it would go on to be uh, in the 70s uh, in the Dragonovs, uh, in the PKM general purpose machine guns. And it would lose a lot of its uh, of its oomph in the small arms because it was now replaced as uh, the standard rifle cartridge by the new 762 by 39 and the AK-47 cartridge. First, it was chambered in the SKS in 1945, which was very quickly replaced in 1947 by the AK-47. And what we have here is a 123 grain bullet at 2,400 foot a second. As you can see, the exact same comp uh, concept between the Germans and the Russians. Now we're going to go forward to the 1950s. When NATO was formed, they had their first, what they would refer to as NATO trials for a new cartridge for use by uh, the new NATO allies. There was two players in this, the United States and British. The British used the, uh, the 303 British cartridge throughout World War II and in, in, their, in their machine guns as well as their, uh, their standard Enfield rifles. They saw what happened with the Germans and with the, uh, with the Soviets. They felt going with an intermediate cartridge would also be a positive move, which they were right. They went with the 280 British. Now, the 280 British was a, a .284 diameter and overall length of 2.54 inches. Uh, it had 139 grain projectile, firing about 2,545 feet a second. This was an excellent uh, potential cartridge for NATO. Now comes the United States. We have the 30 out 6 or the, or the 30 caliber used in the M1 Garand in, in all U.S. Uh, small arms. You had 147 grain bullet, 150 grain projectile traveling at 2,800 foot a second. And what did the U.S. put in? What we have here it was referred to as the T-44 cartridge. That was the exact same projectile, firing it to 2,733 feet a second. So what we did is we went from 7.62 by 63 to 7.62 by 51, which, with modern propellants, gave you the exact same cartridge with a very, very little difference, uh, less than 100 foot a second difference between the two of them. So we had a true cartridge that they had chambered in their new EM2, EM1 rifles, which were bullpup rifles, lighter recoil, easier to control, same concept as the, as the Russians and the Germans, but the U.S. wouldn't have it. Due to the fact that the U.S. Army was, again, entrenched in tradition, you have to have a full powered 30 caliber cartridge with a range of a thousand yards, even though that you weren't looking at that kind of a battle any longer, that tradition was so hell-bent and, and heavy that Studler and the rest of the U.S. Ordnance Corps would not have a sub-30 caliber cartridge. They had poked holes in it uh, everywhere that they could, and of course the USS you know, is very, very influential. In fact, they're a decision-maker when it comes to NATO. Uh, what the U.S. decides, everybody else decides. Uh, they literally forced the 7.62 by 51 millimeter on the British. The British, in my opinion, had an excellent concept. They had something that was still a little bit more potent than the, uh, the you know, than the, the previous 792 by 33 and the 762 by 39. Something still a little more potent than that, but it was still far better cry than the change from the, uh, you know, down to the 7.62 by 51. Unfortunately, when the dust settled, the final decision was a 7.62 by 51 millimeter cartridge. Now the British did not go quietly into the good night. They basically said they knew they had a better concept, they knew they had a better idea, and they went ahead with production of the 280 British and the uh, EM2 car, EM2 rifle for it. Uh, it was Winston Churchill himself who basically told the uh, the British military that you are going to stop production and you're going to go into production of the 7.62 by 51 millimeter NATO cartridge and you're going to change the EM2 over to the FNFAL. So henceforth, we now have the weapons trials. Part of the concessions the U.S. had with NATO was if they were to adopt the 7.62 by 51 millimeter cartridge, the U.S. would go ahead and adopt the FAL rifle. Uh, the FAL rifle went on to be the weapon of the free world. Uh, it was used by virtually all NATO countries. It was an excellent rifle. However, <clears throat> the U.S., very, very fond of their M1 Garand during World War II, uh, and General Patton saying it was the greatest implement, war implement ever devised. Um, this was what the U.S. government liked. Now, I do want to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the problems with the M1 Garand, uh, at least in my opinion, during its development, which was, again, the fault of Ordnance Corps. 
when the M1 Garand was developed, uh, it was developed for use with the BAR magazine, a 20-round magazine. In Oregon Corps' infinite wisdom, uh, they decided they didn't want our soldiers to waste ammunition, so they went from a detachable box magazine to an eight-round stripper clip. So what they basically did was they decreased the firepower uh, on the individual level that the rifle was designed around. It was designed around a 20-round magazine. But again, we had tradition, you know, we want our one shot, one kill. We don't want them to waste ammunition, so they had to carry around these disposable clips and insert them into the, into the rifle. So the M1 Garands were also manufactured in U.S. government arsenals, Rock Island Arsenal, Frankfurt Arsenal, and so forth. And that was the only time in American history, uh, well, the last time in American history that was ever to happen, and we're sort of going to get into a little bit of that in a little bit. Of course, when uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rene Studler uh, decided on a rifle, he had no intention of ever going with the FNFAL. He wanted not only an American-made design, but he wanted it to come out of U.S. government arsenals. Not caring that the U.S. soldier uh, would have been far better off with the, uh, the FAL that NATO was going with, it was a more accurate rifle, it was more durable, it was a 20-round magazine, it was selective fire, uh, and it was uh, controllable on fully automatic. It could be used in all those different uh, conditions. They decided they were going to upgrade their wonderful M1 Garand into what we see here. And this was referred to as T-44 rifle. Now, the rifle that I have access here today uh, is the M21 version. I did not have access to the standard infantry version. But this will do good uh, for me to describe basically what we had here. So what do we have the difference between the M1 Garand and this? Basically, it's the exact same rifle. What they did was they changed the gas system. Uh, they brought the gas system down closer. The reason why the gas system was as such on the M1 Garand, during the development, uh, Mr. Garand wanted to, to make sure that the gas system did not affect accuracy. So he figured having the gas system as close to the muzzle as possible would not have any adverse effects on accuracy. Well. Testing after, after World War II for the new program, uh, they moved the gas system back, finding out that it didn't make much of a difference whatsoever. So we have the gas system moved back, we have the addition of a flash suppressor. We went back to a BAR-style magazine, now chambered in 762 by 51 The action, everything identical to the M1 Garand. The stock was basically the same, and they added a selector lever to make it fully automatic. And in reality, it was a joke. Now, the whole concept around the uh, M14 rifle program was the M14, or the rifle that was chosen to be the M14, was supposed to replace an entire family of weapons. It was supposed to have the firepower of the BAR. It was supposed to have the lightweight of the carbine. It was supposed to have the controllability of the submachine gun. And it was supposed to have the accuracy of the M1. So it was to replace all those firearms in the U.S. inventory. In the end, what did they get? They got a gun that wasn't even as good as the M1 Garand in reliability, and one that didn't replace any of the other ones because it was extremely heavy. It was difficult, if not impossible, to control for your average soldier on fully automatic. It did not replace any of those firearms. Uh, it was basically the exact same thing that they had. That, that was a problem. Uh, it was they were not they were putting the soldier, uh, the American soldier, behind uh, all of our all of our allies. And at the same time this, this program was going on, there was another rifle that came out right towards the end, the Armalite AR-10. Uh, what we have here is an example of the new Brownells uh, retro version of the rifle, but this is an excellent uh, iteration of what that rifle actually was. This is the rifle that should have been the M14. However, just like we stated earlier, this was not designed by the Army, it wouldn't be manufactured by the Army, and it wasn't within tradition. It utilized aluminum, it utilizes uh, synthetics, and it was totally unlike anything the Army had ever seen. Now, when you are so entrenched in tradition, what that does, it makes you impervious and blind to new technology. Even when it's, when it's in front of you, you're seeing, in the case of the AR-10, they did everything that they could to sabotage it. The introduction of the new uh, era in aircraft with the uses of aluminum and alloy, the aluminum alloys dissipated heat better, and they were more corrosion resistant than the steel was. The synthetics were uh, much stronger than the woodwork. They didn't swell when they got humid or when they got when it got rain. And with the new concept of inline construction, it gave you a, the same kind of a rifle that was far more controllable on fully automatic than the current M14. In fact, the M14, as it was issued, because nobody could control it, the majority of those rifles were issued without the selectors in place, which that totally defeats the purpose of it. You have the soldier not having a fully automatic weapon. 
Now, we're also, this is before the Vietnam era. That would come into more of a crisis later on. The Army was forced to take a look at the AR-10, and the testing that the Army put the AR-10 through was not even what their, their T-44 went through. The ammunition that was used in this rifle was a 7.62 NATO ammunition, armor-piercing ammunition, that was rejected because it was too high a pressure. So they used ammunition that wasn't even uh, within spec uh, to test it. The initial AR-10 that they had uh, had a barrel that was uh, it was a steel main barrel wrapped in uh, aluminum to give it more of the light weight. You're looking at a weight on the AR-10 at 6.85 pounds compared to the 8.45 pounds of the T-44 rifle. Significantly lighter. So that barrel was part of keeping that, that weight down a little bit. Well, Gene Stoner was adamantly against having that uh, barrel used. He wanted to use a standard steel barrel, but the, uh, you know, the management at Armalite insisted. And Gene Stoner's fears came, came, tr came true when the, the barrel actually blew on the left side, making an eight-inch eight gap. And, of course, that uh, told the Army that, oh, this is, this is a piece of garbage. It's going to need five years of development. Well, after that, the barrel rupture... Gene Stoner went back over the weekend and he built uh, three fluted uh, standard steel barrels and put them on there to complete the testing. But at the time, Stoodler, uh, again, there was no way anything was going to happen other than his T-44. He didn't care that this was a better rifle. He didn't care that the Fowl was a better rifle. He, he was not concerned with the, with the U.S. soldier having a better rifle. He was concerned with keeping his people in business, keeping people's uh, ranks, you know, higher ranks in, in, in their jobs, keeping guns pumping out of the U.S. US arsenals, even though they were inferior. So... The AR-10 was, uh, was tossed in a scrap heap of history. So now we have a 20-round capacity M1 Garand. And it's uncontrollable and fully automatic. It's extremely heavy. It's not designed for close-quarter combat. It uses a cartridge that's, that's much more powerful, making it uh, less controllable even on semi-automatic. For the most part, when you would fire a shot, you'd have to re-get re your sight picture every time because of the recoil. Now, the FAL rifle, did it before, would have been also an ideal rifle for the U.S. military. It worked out very well for all of the NATO allies. This is not an exact rendition of what the, what the, the rifle that was tried, the T-48. Um, this is just another version of it. It's, you know, it's very, very similar. There's some differences in the stocks, materials, and, and, and uh -huh. various things. But this was the basic rifle. But uh, this was, again, controllable. It had adjustable gas system. Um, it, was, you know, it, was, it was the right arm of the free world, as the British call it. So now we're going to move forward from the 50s to 1965. The first U.S. combat troops arrived in Vietnam in 1965 equipped with the M14 rifle. They had no idea what they were going to be encountering in those jungles with the enemy equipped with the AK-47, a true uh, assault rifle. And when you are in a jungle environment, when you your, your enemy is within 20 feet from you, if even, uh, if even that, your, all your shots are going to be well under 100 yards. And a majority of all of your battles are going to be meeting engagements or ambushes, whether you're ambushing them or they're ambushing you. The only way to get out of an ambush is to provide a heavier volume of fire on the enemy. And they had found when they come under fire uh, from troops with the AK-47s that uh, most of the guys who were carrying our beloved M14, they just hit the dust. Uh, when, they, when they heard that fully automatic fire and it was uh, spraying the area and keeping their heads down, uh, they're not going to have the opportunity for their legendary one-shot kill because they're not going to be able to see where that enemy is. So they basically viewed their fire as being uh, ineffective, and most of the, a lot of the troops did not even uh, engage uh, during an ambush, which was a major, major problem. But at that time, there was another rifle, the AR-15 rifle. Now, this was another rifle that uh, the government was forced to look at um, by the Air Force's request, and they wanted a ultra-modern rifle uh, that would uh, be ideal for the Air Force uh, for replacing the M1 carbines that they were mostly using, more effective rifle. This one here is a scaled-down version of the AR-10. After the U.S. government uh, basically nixed the AR-10, there was no way anything was going to happen with it. The Air Force approached uh, Gene Stoner and said, uh, would you like to get it on a weapons program for us? We're looking for an intermediate caliber cartridge. And Gene Stoner said yes. He knew that his direct gas impingement system or his internal piston was ideal for that. So him along with uh, Mr. Sullivan and some other guys at, at Armalite scaled it down to this. Now, again, this had the same issues that the AR-10 did back uh, in, during the NATO trials. It was not made by the Army. It was a 5.56 millimeter, which, you know, if they weren't going to go for the 280 the British, there was no way in hell they were going to go down to a, a 22 caliber cartridge. It was utilizing synthetics. It was utilizing uh, aluminum. And they just, they just weren't going to have it. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Studler said once again, he goes, the Army has no use for such a weapon. Our M14 is what it needs to be. Well... 
because of the way the Army handled the M16 program, the rifle got its attention through the U.S. military outside normal procurement channels. Uh, once the troops were in Vietnam, a lot of our, uh, our South Vietnamese allies, they were given World War II era weapons uh, to fight the Viet Cong and the NVA. However, uh, their small stature made carrying these heavy M1 Garands and, and so forth uh, it, almost impossible. You're looking at you know, a 90-pound uh, you know, soldier. So they started introducing the AR-15, you know, you know Armalite did, uh, and Colt uh, to, to, to that. And the Army uh, Special Forces, the Green Berets who were over there, they were getting the AR-15s as well to do some testing on them, and they absolutely loved them. They found that this weapon was ideal for jungle warfare. It was light, it was controllable on fully automatic. This matched the AK's firepower, but it made it even better because they were able to be much more accurate than the AK-47 was. Uh, being that it was a 5.56 millimeter uh, ammunition, they were able to carry, you know, down near three times, so times the amount of ammunition they did with the M14. And again, controllable, fully automatic. Fully automatic was necessary because of the ambushes. The, uh, this weapon, along with the M60s, enabled them to a lot of times overpower uh, the NVA and Viet Cong with suppressed, more accurate fire. So, what did the Army do? It was the same thing it was with the uh, M14. Uh, the Ordnance Corps uh, plagued the rifle with, with issues. They uh, they sabotaged it as best as they could. They tried to make it fail. There was a one-time buy of over 100,000 rifles that was uh, against Ordnance Corps' wishes. And Ordnance Corps was ordered by the Secretary of Defense to get this rifle ready for the troops. Because General Westmoreland, after he saw the, you know, what, the, what the AR-15 was, he requested for every uh, maneuver element in entire Southeast Asia. All of our troops, he requested to have the new AR-15 rifle. The Army figured that, well, they knew it was going to fail, so what we're going to do is we're not going to issue cleaning kits, we're not going to put it through its development process, we're going to throw it right into combat, which you never do. You never do any kind of development in combat, it's done before that. And sure enough, the rifle did fail. Uh, they, they screwed up the ammunition, they knew about it uh, ahead of time, but they felt the end would justify the means, even though rifles uh, would malfunction and our troops would be killed because of uh, malfunctioning rifles, they felt the end would justify the means, the Army would settle back on their M14 and it would be done even though that it was the wrong weapon for that kind of a conflict. Well, 1968 came, uh, letters came in to congressmen uh, stating that the rifles were failing on soldiers and they were forced to look into it. They formed a subcommittee uh, headed by um, a representative, a uh, Republican, I believe it was, uh, his name was Richard Eichord. And Mr. Eichord uh, set up a whole committee to investigate the M16 and everything around it. Everything from procurement to the reliability, the ability problems to... Uh, foreign sales, uh, towards everything. This committee actually went to Vietnam and saw what was going on with the rifles. He saw no cleaning kits. He saw that the rifle didn't have a chrome boring chamber, and it was causing a lot of the major failures. He saw the, uh, the pitted chambers. He also found out that the Army was aware of all this stuff long before. He had found out that the Army sabotaged the rifle for as far as filling cyclic rate tests. Uh, when the rifles were being manufactured at Colt, uh, there was a, a cyclic rate limit. Uh, which was 750 rounds a minute uh, for high, for a fully automatic. They could not meet that with a new ball ammunition that they used. It was exceeding 1,000 rounds a minute. So Colt couldn't pass their rifles. So what the Army did was they sent them the IMR uh, propellant, and so they saw so the rifles would pass the testing so they could be shipped to Vietnam. Then once the soldiers got to Vietnam, they gave them the ball ammunition, which was the problematic ammunition. So this was all done deliberately, again, to make the M16 look bad so they would go back to their homegrown M14. Well, the, the findings from this, uh, from this congressional hearing came down to uh, the Army being called criminally negligent in their handling of the program. And once that happened, the Army was forced to fix the rifle, and that was the final nail in the coffin of Ordnance Corps. The Ordnance Corps has uh, failed the U.S. soldier throughout our history. We've had advanced weapons available to us, um, some of the most advanced weapons in the world. Did the Army, because of their own traditions uh, and their own concept of what uh, they thought war was, that we don't need that. The Thompson submachine gun was a very good example of that during World War I. It was designed as a trench broom for trench warfare. You know, they, they didn't want that. Uh, the, uh, the Maxim machine gun, several of the machine guns that were developed here in the United States by Browning. Oh, we don't need that. So our enemies ended up using those before we, before we did. You know, it was a constant failure uh, of them. It was always about, uh, you know, their, their tradition, them keeping their arsenals open. And in reality, is, is most uh, a, lot, a lot of innovations did not come out of the Army anyways. It came out of uh, private firms. With the adoption of the M16, uh, the procurement of M14 stopped. The M14 had a very short six-year service life. It was probably the least of any U.S. military small arm in our history. The U.S. ordnance uh, plants, uh, factories were shut down. 
And from that point forward, you would never see a U.S. manufactured or a U.S. military manufactured weapon system. Everything has been done outside. If you look at today, we have Colt M16. We have FN manufacturing it. We have the FN 240, 249. We have uh, the Beretta M9 and now the SIG uh, M17. They are all manufactured by outside contractors, uh, private companies. Uh, so the U.S. military can no longer uh, cause the same damage that they did to our soldiers they had for all those years during uh, the previous wars. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the M14, the gun, why I didn't particularly care for it. Again, we have a lot of very heavy recoil. We have uh, a very heavy magazine compared to what the AR-10 had. Uh, this was a steel magazine. There's two different concepts. The concept of this magazine was steel to be used over and over again, where the AR-10, it was designed to uh, have a disposable magazine. It's carried preloaded, then it's gotten rid of. Very heavy, heavy system. You have a lot of moving parts. Uh, you uh, have a rifle that's prone not to like to work in the wintertime uh, in the cold because you have so many parts, uh, especially considering you know the AR-10 only had a gas tube. This was more prone to malfunction in the wintertime because of the gun being frozen, and the action being frozen than the AR-10 was. As I previously stated, this was supposed to have the firepower of the BAR. Well, once you took away the select lever, uh, now we have a regular old M1 Garand. Uh, this semi automatic with a 20-shot magazine. The entire concept of uh, being able to have a that kind of firepower was gone. Nobody could control it. It would take an extremely highly trained person to be able to control this thing. Um, if you look at the, uh, the Vietnam War, for instance, I had the opportunity to interview General Moore uh, for a paper I did for Picatinny Arsenal, and it was about his, uh, his, his involvement with the rifle. The Battle of Adrang Valley was the first battle where the M16 was used, and um, it was up close and personal. It was, it was you're crossing bayonets. It was, uh, it, it was close. I asked him if he felt that the uh, M16 had anything to do with the outcome of that battle. He said, absolutely. He said, the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, hand-to-hand -hand combat and the close range that we had, if we had the M14, first of all, it would have been too long to whip around uh, like we needed to do. It would have been much recoil to be able to engage the multiple targets as quickly as they were coming at us. And when we had to use fully automatic fire because we couldn't see the, uh, the targets, the M16 made all the difference in the world. The Army, if they would have had the AR-10 at that time, uh, I don't. I don't think that their AR-15 probably would have uh, come into play. Uh, I think they would have, uh, you know, refined the AR-10 over the years to make it even, even better. They may have even have stuck with a 7.62 caliber. However, the uh, the 5.56 truly was truly was better in my opinion uh, for for human target versus. Uh, the 7.62 um, ballistically, uh, and the, you know, if you're considering the trauma that the 5.56 creates, it was a better decision. But the AR-10 still would have provided them with controllable, fully automatic fire, long-range accuracy, and lightweight. There you really have it. My my despise because comes from the fact that this this weapon did none of what it was supposed to do. It didn't give you the firepower of the of the VAR. It didn't give you the lightweight of the carbine. It didn't give you the controllability of the submachine gun. It didn't do any of that. In fact, it was less accurate than the M1 Garand was. What the Army came out with was the same thing they already had with a couple minor changes. And uh, they overlooked uh, much better weapon systems, so they put our soldiers at a disadvantage right from the get-go. They forced 7.62 down, down NATO's throat when they, uh, there was a better cartridge that was out there. Tradition can really be a bad thing. It, it really can when tradition clouds your judgment. Weapons have uh, gone through a lot of changes over the years. They've, they've gotten better. And if you are so caught in the way things always were done that you are not capable of seeing that there's better equipment out there, and your soldiers, they deserve the finest equipment in the world, and you fail to give it to them. And not to mention when you make decisions that cause people to die because you feel your end would justify the means. So there you have it, uh, why I, I despise this rifle so much. Uh, I don't believe it ever should have existed. Um, we had two rifles that were superior to it, that were available to us at the time, that were ignored. Uh, the FAL and the AR-10. The cartridge should never have been thrown down NATO's, uh, NATO's throat. They should have gone with the 280 British because it was putting us behind where our enemies were, where our Warsaw, Warsaw Pact countries were. And it was giving them uh, firepower superiority on the individual level well over what we had. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. Uh, I know it's a little bit long. I mean, we try to cover a lot of ground. There's a lot more we could have talked about, but I don't think you want to be here for two hours. So again, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share, and please consider joining our Patreon.